Hello, everyone. Welcome to Six Man. Holly and I are chairing. Um, I think we have enough people to get going. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the note well. You should note it well. Next slide. Um, there's been a trivia, Japper room. You're obviously in the Meet Echo session, I hope. Um, Barbara and Su Ping are taking minutes. Our thanks to them. Um, minutes will be available. Um, and there's the link to where the presentations are. I think Meet Echo also has a, a button that gets you to that. Next slide. So um, we did something a little different for these sessions. We had two 120-minute um, sessions and um, a variety of um, session requests. So for today, we're doing the new internet drafts and drafts that have had some discussion, but there is, doesn't seem to be a lot of working group support. Um, the goal is to give time to the speakers to basically make the case for what they are proposing and see if the working group is interested. Um, the second session on Thursday morning, <clears throat> or at least Thursday morning my time, um, will include the usual introduction and document status. We're getting a report from the spring compression design team um, and then working group and act active working group drafts. Next slide. And so this is today's agenda. Um, hopefully all the speakers are here. Next slide. And this is the agenda for Thursday. And so any, any comments on the agenda, agenda bashing? Okay, don't see any. Next slide. Then we are ready for our first speaker, I believe. Uh, let's Good. see. So, Linda, are you here? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Please oh, go that's ahead. great. That's great. Okay, so so this is uh, about IPv6, IPv6 solution for the 5G edge computing sticky service. We presented this at IET at 109, and we got quite a few comments. So we address those comments and come back with the um, update. Next slide, please. OK, so this is just a brief update um, background of the 5G edge computing project. So this is the 3GPP uh, TR23748. So in that project, it identified many um, mission critical use cases uh, for local, they call local data network for the 5G core um, to achieve those um, uh, edge computing. One of the requirement there is um, those edge computing services um, are controlled by their application function controller and they are using any cache addresses. And uh, you can see here, um, that uh, um, from 5G core, uh, user traffic is um, uh, anchored to uh, PSA, PDU, so PDU session anchor, which is part of the function of the uh, user plane function. And um, there's always router to ingress router to the um, LDN, local data network. And those um, um, services, edge computing services, any kind of servers, um, are located um, in the mini data center in very close proximity to the um, UPF function. There are many of them to achieve the mission critical services. Um, so um, the assumption is that those services are not are directly attached and not very far, and uh, there are many of them there. And any cache is used uh, to address multiple um, servers. 
actually server to uh, to the network pers perspective actually m may be the application layer load balancers they may have multiple load balancers with multiple servers behind them but from the network perspective is the only the the uh, load balancer be visible next slide please okay so um in that document it identify many benefits of the anycast right basically leverage a network layer to provide to optimize the balancing among different uh, um, uh, load balancer and uh, also eliminate the single point of failure at a particular load balancer um, and avoid the um, stale um, entry in the user device because some of them don't always query uh, DNS when they change from one location to another location but it also introduced problems um, as well because they are so close in proximity and so that uh, the routing distance are very small. The differences uh, to different uh, egress routers are not very large. Uh, the benefit is um, any of them can serve the service, and but, um, but you need to stick to a spe specific ones if you move. And uh, you could have unbalanced distribution, right? You, because UE move frequently, so that uh, even though you plan ahead, you put three load balancers attached to three um, routers, because UE move may all, all um, anchor towards like particular site, and so causing one um, site to be overutilized, others being less. Um, on top of that, you could have other issues with more additional server being added um, during the operation during the lifetime of the server. Next page, please. So the sticky service is really um, about uh, um, the the assumption that um, not all services need sticky service. Only the ones which need the network to optimize. They register with the 3GPP and the 3GPP recognize those services and then the network provide additional um, optimization to distribute among different egress routers. So that's very important the part because we are not doing it for everybody. Um, ACLs are used on the egress router like R1, R2 and ingress router RA, RB. So that's very important. Uh, part. Next page, please. So next page. So um, using the tunneling to achieve sticky service, what it is, is um, when the router ingress router RA, based on the running status, um, the dis distributed from the egress router, and create a tunnel, and to the specific um, the 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 egress router like R1 be selected, and when the um, UE move to another um, location, the router itself will be able to um, distribute the sticky service ID and the flow ID and sticky egress address to the neighboring um, ingress router. Those are statically configured. Each router is configured with a set of the routers which are close by that the service, when they move to anchor to uh, their corresponding PSA, the, the user traffic should stay together with um, to the sticky egress. Bear in mind that um, many of those applications are capable of handling um, different locations. It just at application layer, they can actually coordinate and move, move the session ID at the application layer. But it just takes time. And for some mission critical services, they would like network to help them to achieve better, to stick to the original one to finish the session. Um, next page, please. So, um, in tunnel service, um, that the 5G core could coordinate with the ingress router, so that um, um, so that that um, um, the because the session movement, the session control in the 5G C, 5G core can know that when you e move from um, site A to site B, um, there's a session control that keep 
um, that great uh, period of transition, it knows where uh, the next UPF is going to. Uh, correspondingly, it can notify the router, telling the router ahead of time that this uh, particular UE is moving um, from um, PSA1 to PSA2, uh, corresponding the ingress router RB. So with this, the router A doesn't have to send to multiple um, um, ingress routers anymore. It only sent to one that needed information. Next page. So here it is um, like um, um, we can either use the destination um, extension header uh, or the hop by hop um, um, extension header in the tunnel so that um, the traffic when coming back and in the in the middle of the network they know where to send it to um, in the tunnel um, and uh, keeping track of the information so that uh, all the intermediate nodes is aware of um, this particular service has to be sent to the ingress r1 mm, next page please And in the document, we propose this um, um, sub-TLV, which we call sticky uh, distance sub-TLV. So with sticky service, we have sticky type, um, like, um, and the sticky type showing that how much um, this particular service needs to stick to the original egress. Some can be strongly need to be stick to, uh, some can be um, loosely stick to. Um, and um, then there's most important information is the destination, um, um, destination um, basically egress addresses, uh, egress address uh, for the sticky for the service to be sticked to. Next page, please. Um, so this is mapping to APN. There's a big initiative on the APN um, for application aware. They propose this application aware ID and application aware service parameter sub TLVs. So we just map into um, what they have proposed. Um, so they have an SLA level. Um, here we have sticky level map to the SLA level. Uh, they have application ID. Here is the sticky service ID map into um, um, that particular field. Another one is their user ID, which can be the UE information. Um, and then there's a flow ID. And then the sticky service sub TLV is mapped into the service parameter sub TLV. Uh, they just showing how those can be uh, utilized of the APN 6, that document. Over there, they mentioned about using um, a hop by hop count to carry the information or if the uh, local data network is the um, SRV6, and how do we ca carry the information in the SRV6 header? So all that are applicable when we map into um, those application aware ID. Next page. I think that's it. And uh, we need your feedback. And um, potentially, we, we think the draft is ready for working group adoption. So where do you see, I mean, there's clearly work going on in other areas here. Is, uh, is Six Man the best home for this? Or, or, you know, could Six Man review any destination options specified elsewhere, for example? What, what are the other oh. working groups working on this? OK, so we have proposed in several working groups uh, for different aspects. Uh, for six men is only to identify the the next hop uh, option header or destination option header to carry the sticky information. Uh, that's what the work to be done at six men. At IDR working group is to carry the information from the egress router, like egress router, um, keep track of all the all the packets to and from those particular. Um, um, any cat servers like load balancer. Um, they also have information about their uh, um, their the site capacity. That's because some mini data centers may have higher capacity than others, and you could also carry the information about preference. Like for example, one 
mini data center has higher network capacity or more preference than the others. So those information need to be propagated to the ingress router so that the past computation can include um, not only the round trip delay, because typically today, uh, networking, when we have multiple paths to a destination, we always use our network um, parameter like um, um, distance, routing distance, to determine which one is the optimal one. So with those additional information, the ingress router will be able to uh, combine the, the routing distance in addition to um, the, the capacity or um, of site preference, add it together, apply the uh, combined weight to choose the optimal path. And there's also a proposal in the OSPF extension that allow OSPF to carry those information to the uh, to the nodes which care about choosing uh, the path based on not only the routing distance but also the weight of the okay. egress. Yep. Okay. Thank, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we have Fred in the queue. Go ahead, Fred. Hi there. Um, yeah, so they have a draft in V6 Ops as well. Um, they will be asking for working group adoption uh, today. And um, I don't expect it. We, we discussed this in email. I don't expect to see the working group adopted unless it uh, is conformist to the V6 Ops charter. Um, at the moment, the draft in V6 Ops changes the of, of IPv6, and you know that that's your ball, not mine. Okay. Yes, I think um, our well judgment so far has been that we haven't seen much discussion on the mailing list, uh, so we are you know unsure of of the interest in in this work. Um, if there is enough and sufficient interest in a working group. I suppose I could use the hands show hands tool and see what uh, if, if well, people I, have. I have Go a on, question for Linda. Um, so the work that this is related to, like the APN work, has that been adopted in another working group? No, no, it, because we just proposed everything just last IETF 109. So, yeah, so in the IDR, we my, plan to ask my, for. My thinking is that. Um, it, it would be more appropriate to ask six men to adopt this once it's actually a real work item somewhere else, and then then it would be reasonable for us to evaluate, you know, the the IPv6 um, extension headers it, that you're proposing. But I think until that happens, I think it might be. I think it's a little early. I see. That's a good good suggestion. Thank you. I did start a raise of hand session, so you're, um, if you want to raise your hand or not, there is a uh, session ongoing while we uh, move on to the next presentation. Uh, thanks a lot, Linda. Thank you. So, Alexander, I think you're presenting the, uh, the next session. Uh, please go ahead. Feel free to enable video as well if you, uh, if you want to. Uh, yes, uh, hello. Uh, do you hear me? You. We can hear you. And I'm, I'm sending video as well. Do you yes. see me? We are. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to present. I am going to talk about uh, Slack, stateless address auto configuration, with uh, prefixes of arbitrary length in the PIO. Uh, we uh, in discussions, we talk about variable Slack. Um, I am the presenter, Alexander Petrescu, and my co-authors are listed on the slide. And this is ITF 110 in March 2021. Next slide, please. Um, the contents of the presentation, I will mention only two points that are described in this draft. Uh, uh, in the introduction, a little bit of the problem statement for VSLAC and the one slide on the implementation of VSLAC. But in the draft, there are more topics that have uh, been uh, um, given equal importance. Uh, I'm listing them bullet by bullet. Uh, the history, what we understand, the history behind the 64 bit uh, fixed boundary, the, uh, some statements about identifier and subnet length. 
third bullet recommendations for implementations of VSLAC. Um, then a recommended use cases where 64-bit prefixes, not VSLAC, uh, should be utilized, a large majority of cases. Then um, uh, what are the reasons for longer than 64-bit prefix length? And then um, uh, it, using greater than 64 prefixes uh, by ISP is normally strictly prohibited, so we don't have a race to the bottom problem. Uh, a brief comparison between static SLAC, DHCPv6, and VSLAC, and then again uh, some variable SLAC use cases. And then I will go now to describe uh, some points of the problem statement. Next slide, please. Um, well, there are very many aspects of this uh, problem. We selected uh, only a few of them that uh, I try to illustrate with a figure in the center of the slide and the bullets, bullet points in the right part of the slide. In the center of the slide, in the upper part, you see in the figure the internet and a GGSN, which is part of the 3GPP network, and that advertises a 64 prefix to the UE, which is the user equipment then this user equipment needs to extend the network beyond uh, this uh, just 164. So it could try to use to make a 65 prefix uh, or even a 66 for the subnets behind the user equipment. Such use cases are, for example, a mobile hotspot, uh, a subnet in an automobile or other mobile platforms. Now, in the text part on the right-hand side, um, I list the text about what are the, the problems in doing that. First and foremost, in the IPv6 addressing architecture, RFC 4291, all the addresses currently allocated, which are 2000 com com stage 3, cannot have other than 64-bit interface identifiers. The second bullet is that uh, all mobile operators all mobile phone operators allocate one 64 prefix for one user equipment. Third bullet says that the DHCPv6 prefix delegation is blocked by a majority, if not all modems of the mobile equipment. Um, it is also impossible in implementation to use Slack with a prefix of length 65 in the router advertisement. For example, in Linux, uh, this is, uh, is not working simply. This makes that the problem is that it is impossible to extend the network to multiple subnets beyond the user equipment. For further description of the problem, we refer to this draft Mishra V6 of variable slack problem statement that is pasted at the bottom of the slide. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the implementation that we wrote and that we propose uh, in this draft. Next slide, please. Um, the implementation that uh, we wrote, I, I thank actually to Dmitro Shiti, our co-author, for this uh, writing that he took several months to, to make it, to, to progress it. Um, in, in Linux, it is a, just a local parameter, a CCTL. The default value of this parameter is zero, which means that the Slack behaves, acts as before, uses 64-bit IIDs and prefix names. But if an operator sets this value to one, it makes that prefixes of length other than 64 are accepted for Slack. For example, a host that receives a 63 in an array, will form an IA interface ID of length 65, and subsequently an address of length 128. Uh, this implementation is a patch uh, freely available on GitHub. <coughs> and um, we have also submitted for consideration to Linux uh, maintainers, but we have some feedback from them asking uh, the status of uh, uh, of this uh, proposal uh, that we have uh, here at ITF. In OpenBSD, we have learned that there is an implementation of RFC 7217 that works okay with variable length PLANs in Slack. And in FreeBSD, 
this is not work. the variable slack is not working only 64 bit IADs are uh, implemented respecting the standards and we have submitted what we think to be a bug report and we complain about this 64 bit bit limit in that uh, so that is the implementation that I was trying to present. And uh, at this point, um, uh, I might wonder if there are any comments. Otherwise, I have an additional slide on, the, on what we discussed, uh, not publicly, but privately with a few people about the potential next steps. But if there are any comments here, I'm, <clears throat> I'm interesting to, we are interesting, we authors are interesting to hear these uh, comments. Jen, go ahead. Uh, first of all, I have a deja vu, right? I think we've been in the discussion a couple of times, but I have like two questions. First of all, why are you calling BSD behavior a bug? My understanding is we are all here to discuss how operating systems should behave, and after we agree on something, that should be implemented. If operating system started to do something which is currently prohibited by RFCs, I would not call it a bug, right? If they start doing this, like we all can go home and just forget about making any standards because operating system would do whatever they want. And uh, I'm also a bit confused about the draft. I read it, and in the beginning of it, the draft is saying, we want to do prefixes which are shorter than 64, and we go in and explain why. And yes, we also allow in longer prefixes, but operators should not do this now. And then the old use cases I found in the document talking about longer prefixes, and I could not find any compelling use case for shorter ones. So I'm not sure why we need this, especially providing that I'm quite sure that operators would not listen, right? They only do in 360 for now because they could not do longer. As long as we allow them to do longer, it would be the race for the bottom. And our way you should not do this would not work. So I'm still not convinced we are not opening the door to the race to the bottom by doing this. Uh, yes, if I can reply at uh, this point. Um, um, uh, on the calling it a bug report, I think it is because the tool of submitting proposals of improvements is called a bug reporting tool, if I remember correctly. But okay, probably bug is uh, should not be used, but we, we could also see it as a suggestion for uh, a new functionality that, that could also be a uh, experimental functionality, if you wish, into which some things are tried, but uh, by default they should be off, of course. Then, um, um, with, with respect to the question of these shorter and longer prefixes, okay? Now, basically, I agree with you that if VSLAC allows for longer prefixes, then operators might be tempted to allocate longer prefixes to the end users. And that could create a race to the bottom problem, and that is not good and should be avoided. There should be something, some tool, some mechanism, I don't know, that should not allow for this to happen. I don't know what. But now for shorter than 64, shorter than 64 prefixes, then that, is, that could be a good idea. And if the operator Advertises, advertises a shorter than 64 prefix to the end user, then the end user would still need to form a 65-bit uh, interface ID, which is the interface ID is longer than 64. That is what we tried to express. Maybe we could clarify it. And, and then the third point that to answer this is that <clears throat> if, the, if this document does not progress or is out, outright rejected, not even as experimental accepted, or if, if this is completely stopped, then in the implementation, I must say that I will be uh, again tempted to use uh, uh, this uh, 66 prefixes inside the extended network, because the operators will always allocate a 64, and then the only thing uh, one could be tempted to do is to create 66 out of this. So that is a condition. Uh, I'm not sure I answer whether 
I uh, we could discuss further about this, uh, but uh, I agree with most points that you raise, uh, Jen, and uh, the draft could be further clarified uh, on these uh, points. And the slide could be improved to remove this bug word. I, yeah. It's, yeah. Any more comments? <coughs> Do you want to you show your about... last slide, uh, Alexander? Yeah, please, last slide, please. If I, I, I think I still have five more minutes. We, we, we brainstormed uh, with a few people. Uh, and um, I, 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 um, a few suggestions were made, but it's nothing private about this, but I really trying to push this forward, but I, I, I'm, not try, I'm not clear how to proceed and how to. So one, one of the points that was, was uh, listed is to, to make a liaison between IETF and 3GPP and maybe make the most of this work at 3GPP such that make a requirement at 3GPP to, to uh, advertise shorter than 64 prefixes to the user equipment. That's a, a possibility. A second bullet says that we could link the VSLA concept to the GTP um, uh, generic tunnel encapsulation protocol, I think that is a 3GPP protocol. So these two concepts could work together. A third bullet suggests that <clears throat> maybe we could ask IANA for a sub range of this 1FFE slash 3 space, all these addresses that start with 000, zero, zero binary which is not subject to the 64-bit boundary. And this, this could be performed on an experimental kind of uh, activity into which not only VSLA could, could be used, but maybe other drafts, and maybe a, a little bit of short, small, longer prefixes, but smaller space uh, in this that could be allocated. That again, a uh, fourth bullet is to make VSLA on an experimental status was suggested Fifth bullet is an activity that was started at the earlier IETF uh, on a 64 share V2 uh, camera barn, I, I think, proposed it, but it's not an internet draft. And maybe it could be possible to take that text, put it in a real internet draft, and submit it to IETF. Then the next bullet make a lightweight prefix delegation mechanism for ND and NDPD. Uh, I'm not sure whether somebody has already worked, and this is basically a question I have to people present in the room, if somebody already worked on this uh, NDPD lightweight prefix delegation. Next bullet is to use a method like in draft Naveen, into which a host puts a specific request in RS, router solicitation, to request multiple 64 prefixes or a non-64 prefix, maybe. That's another protocol proposal. Um, and then I know that Pascal Kuber has a activity proposal for IP over wireless, and uh, since this happens on a wireless link, uh, maybe bring this like there. And uh, also Edward uh, proposes an activity or a sort of concept on next generation Slack. Uh, and maybe VSLA could be part of that next generation Slack. That's a, another potential next step. And then again, uh, somebody also proposes, is, is there always, is there another way possible for this to, to proceed? Is there another, because the problem is still there, all mobile operators allocate a 64 to a user equipment and um, many user equipments need to extend uh, beyond. So that's the, that is, uh, that is my last slide. Uh, yeah, I hope I managed. Well, I'm all ears now, I listen. <laughs> you seem to be missing, at least in home net, this was also discussed, you know, many years ago and the solution they um, at least implemented uh, was just to use uh, the HAP, which supports other prefix lengths uh, just fine. At least, um, there you have a solution that is widely implemented and supported in all equipment. Uh, yes, noted. There is HomeNet, uh, probably others, and I, I will now. It would in yeah. HomeNet protocols are normally for home networks, in-house. So, so, sorry, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't at all suggest the HomeNet 
protocols. I, I suggested that they also discussed this exact same problem. And the solution they chose was, was a solution that has been standardized for many, many years, which is just to use DHCP for address assignment. Then you don't need to care about 64-bit boundaries. You know, you can make a small allocation links as you, you like without any changes to either implementation or standards. Yeah, yeah. Maybe home net protocols, standardized home net protocols, DHCP, maybe in home they are not blocked by uh, manufacturers of chips in home. I probably... I, uh, you, you don't need to run this across the 3GPP link, right? You, this is all you, you're proposing here is inside of the network, right? So if you just don't use Slack, you can use the HTTP for address assignment instead inside of the site, and this will be, um, will not require any changes. Yeah. Okay, there might be, you know, some. Yeah. We have Lorenzo in the queue, why don't you go ahead? Um, yeah, so I actually had a question about the, the modems, the modem vendors blocking DHPPD. I mean, I think that seems like, um, you know, do you have data on why they do this? Because, I mean, it's, it's not sort of written in any standard that they should do this. And in fact, the 3GPP release 10 standards do support um, release 10 and above. And now we're on release 15 or 16. They do support um, DHP, so DHPPD. It's a supported part of 3GPP. So the other thing is, you know, given that, I I'm not sure that you know, there's actually a problem to solve here. If, if, if your primary use case is to be able to assign a larger than, a shorter than 64 prefix to a mobile node, that's already supported by the CGPP standards. It's just a deployment problem. And writing a new draft is unlikely to affect the, the reasons why it is or is not deployed. Um, yes, so uh, with respect to, um, uh, why uh, some or most uh, mod mobile modem manufacturers block uh, DHCP v6 because that is what they block. They don't block in particular the PD part of the, but DHCP v6. Blocking DHCP v6 means blocking the port numbers of DHCP v6 and or blocking the multicast part of uh, DHCP v6. These are the two things that are blocked by various man. Now, why they do that? We have a list of reasons why they do. I mean, we speculate why they do. We don't know exactly why. And even some people at the modern manufacturers make some statements that are backed more or less by some. So there, are, there is a list of reasons. One of them that it, it might be a heavy operation to do DHCP as opposed to doing Slack. Um, the other is that uh, it constitutes a any open port is a security hole, and multiplied by the number of uh, smartphone devices sold, uh, it uh, amplifies a lot this uh, security risk. Another is that these modern manufacturers have heard from uh, ITF and from others, which is a old uh, wisdom at ITF that in IPv6, the way to configure addresses is uh, Slack and not DHCP. So that's a old wisdom, but it still persists in many circles. And uh, I think that these are the main reasons that I have uh, heard about, but that, that is the way it is. That, that, that is the way it is in, in practice. And uh, probably new releases will change things, but it is now several years that operators allocate only 64s to end users. I forgot the second question. Lorenzo. <laughs> Um, if this is just a deployment problem, right? If the operators wanted to want to use DHPPD or anything else, really, that that's there for them to use right now, uh, writing an, another draft or another standard is not going to uh, affect that, right? I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it is true. It is also suggested to do to make this more of a 3GPP uh, document or a, a requirement at 3GPP. And my reply to that is that uh, sometimes um, uh, 3GPP does refer to internet drafts when writing their own requirements. And so that is a, probably a possibility. I mean, 
yeah, we could we could try to to do that rather than uh, than uh, pushing this uh, forever at <laughs> at ITF. And uh, yeah, it's a good uh, suggestion that we take into account. We we will also look into that uh, AGPP. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, super. Right. Thank you. Uh, another time. Thank you. So then we have our next presentation, Associated Channel over IPv6 with uh, Fan Yang, you are presenting, right? Please go ahead. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Oh, okay, good, because it shows there is some error there. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. And um, this is a, a very uh, new draft, it's the 00, 00 version draft. And in this draft, we introduce uh, an, asso uh, an associated channel over IPv6. And this, uh, for short, we name this associated channel as ACH, and the current uh, scope is uh, IPv6 networks. Next page, please. Yeah, the, uh, the higher level motivation uh, is we see that uh, from uh, from IP bar, IPv6, IPv4 to MPRS, and from MPRS to IPv6. Uh, and currently, nowadays, the IPv6 provide connectivity in many uh, new emerging and also the legacy net, um, networks. And in all these uh, scenarios. Actually, the IP, per, IP services require the higher quality of the RSA guarantee, and uh, rather than the best effort. And we see the segment routing over IPv6 provides optimized route for service forwarding via the routing programming on SR, SRH. And we introduced this ACH and to provide the control and management uh, program, programming capabilities and to the to the service forwarding. Yeah, next, please. And um, later on, we will have some examples um, to show the uh, ap uh, ap applica ap applicability. Yes. And the SH architecture and and the the cloud in the middle is the represent the it is IP network and the the two the, the there is a black link black line between the first node and the fourth node and it represents the it is an ip pass and user data is transmitted in the uh, along the ip pass in the in the yellow arrow and this blue arrows are the associate channel created to the ip ip pass and it is um if you if you look at one arrow it is a control channel and it and this associate channel is connected is associated to uh, IP forwarding paths and carrying the messages of the control and management protocols and aiming to provide the control and man management functions and if you see if you look at the uh, the right bottom uh, graph there and it shows uh, where the SH uh, in the in one network node and the control and management planes can control and management planes generate the control and management messages and carry it in the associate eight in associate channel and transmit it in the data plane yeah next page please Uh, yes, in the draft, uh, we define the ACH as a, T, as a TLV format, and the first type specified it is a control channel for the one specific IP pass, and this, uh, the channel type specifies the type of the control or management con protocols. To identify the, the IP pass and also associate the IP pass to the ACH, um, the associated channel ID is identified there. Uh, it is defined there and uh, the control and management uh, messages can be carried in the in the fixed it messages in the in the value field and this ACH flag uh, this is uh, the, it is a ACH TLV so this TLV can be flexible encapsulated in the IPv6 extension headers, including the DOH, hop by hop, or SRH. It can also be encapsulated uh, as payload in, in the synthetic uh, packet. 
and I will use the following examples to show the application, the end-to-end -end application, how about how applications. Next page, please. Yeah, um, we identified our, um, uh, uh, we give just two expand examples. One is the, uh, we, we call it, we use it for, for the unified uh, OEM. Um, here we give us three protocols, we list three protocols that used for the OEM uh, functions. And we also identify this, uh, sub several problems that this uh, protocols, uh, with this protocols. Uh, for example, these protocols are uh, designed for to uh, perform different functions, uh, different OEM functions, but they also have uh, overlapped functions, and they use different session identifiers, um, and also dipped in encapsulated in the IP IP packet, and if if there's an and because they are defined for this defined as an end-to-end session, so the intermediate node is not aware by the end end-to-end uh, end session. So uh, we try to come up with a simple uh, sol solution to carry this OEM messages in the ACH uh, because the ACH is a TLV encapsulated in IP layer. So this, this, info, this, all these uh, OEM messages are encapsulated in, in pure a uh, IP layer and it to reduce the, the number of protocols sessions and also unify the session identifiers. Yeah, the figure uh, below shows that um, there, um, the example is that if uh, we encapsulated a uh, delay management measurement uh, ACH TLV inside the IPv6, um, actually I should use the DOH header, um, and this and this uh, ACH this T, ACH TLV is, is encapsulated in the IP layer and transmitted from R1 to R4. When R4 receive it um, and uh, it will process the ACH TLV as it um, since it is the last uh, it is the destination of the IP pass. Um, and to re when it received the ACH TLV, it, uh, it processed the, uh, the the TLV and measured the delay. Uh, next page, please. Yeah, the ca second case it it. it it is more uh, complicated, but it's very easy to understand. Um, uh, from Actually, there are two uh, associate channels used here. And the first one is R1 generated this, um, this uh, fault management probe and um, to R4. And this, uh, this is, uh, this, um, this uh, fault management ACH TLV is encapsulated in the IPv6 hop by hop extension header, so that uh, each had uh, each node will process this TLV. And uh, if, if, for example, if R3 detect there is a signal degradation on the link, and it can simply uh, set the flag uh, when it process the TLV and uh, indicate the indicate the 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 arrow to the uh, to the uh, um, to the following node and when r4 received this indication and it it generates another uh, protection switch request um, uh, to R1 to ask ask R1 to switch the uh, the forwarding pass but uh, this message is uh, is using another uh, uh, this message is using another uh, associate channel, and this in on this associate channel, it is end to end. Uh, and the uh, the the ACH DRV is encapsulated in the DOH uh, header because it is uh, a message sent from end to end uh, to tell uh, R1 there is a not um, to tell R1 the the request of the switch. And you, you can see they use different uh, associate channel and with different associate channel uh, ID and also specify the different uh, channel type. Yes, next please. And, um, and we, uh, yes, uh, actually so far we have already uh, received a lot of comments and suggestions uh, to about this draft. So we would like to 
have more uh, discussion on this topic and to refine this SH, um, how it used in IPv6 network. And it's, but maybe uh, since IP, uh, since uh, segment routing uh, SRV6 is uh, a specific type of IPv6, uh, we may also want to specify um, um, may, may maybe um, specify the AC, how ACH used in on um, how AA ACH used over SRV6 maybe in another draft, and we also see there are different uh, depending on the applications that um, the the ACH can be used in different ways. So we better um, with better to se to separate the draft to specify the application used uh, in ACH. Yeah and. Uh, um, I, and I also want to say that actually SH is not, uh, maybe I, I have two examples here, but SH is not designed for only for OAM. Um, we would like to have it uh, to uh, to have SH to carry the control and management uh, messages um, for different use uh, applications. Um, yes, okay. uh, that's it. Thank you see if there's any questions from the working group i have a few but uh yeah I, actually i also have this uh, uh, discussion with uh, uh i think in other uh i'm not uh maybe okay, privately well, i'm not sure <laughs> sorry um yeah, I said, um, who has any questions yeah actually we want to uh, present this uh, go ahead. Eric? Eric. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask um, about the relationship to other IOAM work. I know there's some stuff in IPPM and and other things. Yeah. Um, actually, if you, if, you, if you ask me the relation between ACH and IOAM, I think IOAM was one of the case that can make use of the, uh, can, can be one of the um, uh, type of uh, ACH. And why we, I think the big difference is IOM is only spec uh, only designed for the OAM. But if you, um, if you just look at the encapsulation, they are, maybe they are similar, but the, 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 the design um, background, uh, the, I mean, the design behind these two technology are different because we see there are um, there are so many um, control and management messages. There are requirements to carry this control and management uh, messages on the IP layer if we don't have a uh, segment routing. But we um, but we we don't have a we don't we we, we don't have some. Some of them, they don't have any uh, signaling protocol to carry them. So, mm, I mean, ACH is 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 designed it is open to to um, I mean, uh, it's open to any applications that if you think that is it it should be used in in the IP layer. Um, yeah, um, for yeah, in some. So, um, to sum yeah, up, I think IOM is one one of the uh, type of SH. Um, uh, currently, I, I I don't have it in the draft, but I have some um, I have something in uh, in mind to to use it to use SH in other uh, other application. But um, but um, 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 yeah, it's just uh, under the discussion. So maybe maybe in, in future that we. C we can have more um, um, application use cases there. Yeah, so how does this relate to other things like APN? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I don't have this uh, on mind. So um, currently, the, I mean, from my side, it's, it's not so related to APN. Yeah. OK. And and this is these are just this is just traffic between routers so the packets are created by the routers. This is not inserting this in data packets. 
No, I think it's limited to to the to the network nodes. Um, uh, currently, we don't want to uh, have this app capability uh, from uh, between the hosts. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I think we are out of about out of time. So thank you. Or right, I guess you have another talk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> thank <Yes>. you. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, this word, this topic includes two uh, drafts. One is the the draft uh, named uh, segment, segment routing for redundancy protection in Spring Working Group, and the second is the this one is the SRH extension for this redundancy protect, protection. And yeah, uh, I will give this uh, this uh, the introduction for both of them. Yeah. Next, please. And. It, just a short introduction uh, to to this redundancy protection. What it is? So actually, the uh, the service per protection is, comes from one of the three uh, technology technologies defined techniques defined in uh, deterministic networking uh, in the DAN networking group. And also, we see there are also requirements for provided strict end-to-end -end reliability uh, to the services. So here that we have this redundancy protection it is one of the mechanism to achieve these the service protection and it follows the principle of pre-off and that stands for the package replication elimination and uh, ordering function that we have a uh, example scenario very simple example scenarios there and uh, when the, when there is um, uh, when the flow arrives um, and we name this uh, the red red is the, is the redundancy node and the mer is the merging node and we when there is a flow uh, comes to the redundancy node and the the flow is replicated to two copies and these two copies uh, two copies uh, will go through different paths to the merging node uh, the first one will go to the um, will go from re re uh, redundancy node to R3 to merging node, and the second is to R4 to merging node. And the first received packet with, this, uh, with the sequence number, uh, with the, the same sequence number uh, packet, the first packet with the same sequence number will be uh, transmitted from merging node to R2, and the other one, the redundant packet, will be dropped. So that in this way that to protect this redundant pass to protect there is no packet loss to protect the 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 service without the packet loss. Yes. Next, please. Yeah, to support the, the redundancy protection, actually, we defined four uh, information. And the first, first is the redundancy segment. Redundancy segment. Uh, it is uh, it performs the packet replication function on the redundancy node. And it's associated with a redundancy policy, actually, is a variant of the SR policy. And in in and in case of the SRB6, that we define a new behavior and R. Um, the the second piece of information, uh, the second information is the merging segment, and is the, similar to the redundancy segment. It performs the package rep elimination on the merging node, and a new behavior and M is defined. And to identify the unique flow and and identify the packet sequence with within one flow, that we define the flow identification as a and the sequence number there. And in this draft, it, we extend the SRH op optional TRE to encapsulate, encapsulate them. And the last uh, information is that we define this redundancy policy actually is a variant of SR policy. The difference is we have more than one ordered list of segments and all these other list of segments are used at the same time. That's the difference from, uh, from normal SR policy. And the, the, the blue uh, and the test in blue is what we have for the in the draft uh, in the draft at uh, in this working group. Next, please. 
Yeah, we here we take as our success as an example to show the redundancy protection uh, process. Um, actually, here we have uh, we have two different um, uh, uh, two choices to deploy this. Uh, this process and uh, the difference is depending on where do you want to assign the flow ID and generate the sequence number and the first choice is to use it is you assign the flow ID to the to the ingress node of the SRV6 uh, domain and generated the sequence number there and the second choice is, is you define the assign the flow ID to the redundancy node and also the sequence number will be generated there and the difference between these two choices is the first one that you have the flow ID and the sequence number uh, causing the pass all over the the the, the SRV6 pass uh, forwarding pass and the second choice is that you have this two uh, information only between the redundancy node and the merging node um i want to ex i want to explain the all these headers but uh, let's just focus on the trv the in the orange in the orange color in orange and this is this will um identify the the flow identification the sequence number and we encapsulated in the trv that in the in the ipv6 uh, srh header and this information is carried to the um to the merging node. Actually, this information is only um, uh, uh, only uh, only meaningful for the merging node when it's uh, perform the elimination, and and um, yeah, and also and um, let me think if I miss a, miss anything, and yeah, by using this information and it's. Um, it um, forward the 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 packet and also drop the the redundancy packet, but that is defined. Uh, that is the behavior def definition that defined in the merging node, uh, in the merging segment. So um, yeah, I think that 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 is what I want to explain here. That there are two different uh, choices, but no matter which different which choice, this information will be encapsulated in the in the IPv6 header, where the merging node uh, proceed, process the, the the merging segment, so it always uh, in they are always uh, encapsulated together in one IPv6 uh, header. Yeah. Uh, next, please. Uh, yet yeah, and here every a very simple TLV defined to carry this two information, and uh, I also see there are discussions in the in the mailing list to to discuss that uh, the flow uh, the IPv6 flow label can be used to identify the flow ID. So um, I think I, I I would like to have more discussion there. Um, yeah, C currently I do I don't have any any uh, strong preference to to have it. Uh, uh, in the in the TRE or in the or in the IPv6 uh, flow identification uh, flow label, but I think it also uh, be affected by the choice that we made uh, from last slide. If we want to use it only between the redundancy node and the merging node, I think that's that it's it's okay to use it in, as the IPv6 flow label. But if you want to use it. Um, if you want to have the have the flow identification from the ingress of the uh, of the SRV6 domain, that means that you will have um, yeah this this flow label will be used for ECMP and also used for the uh, for this redundancy uh, protection. So that will be um, some conflict there, I think. Yeah. Next, please. Um. Oh, never mind. So is, oh, yeah. is that the yeah. same flow label as in the IPv6 header or something different? Yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned this IPv6 header uh, flow flow label. Yeah, because people think that um, they are, there are some discussion that they think the flow identification can be carried in the IPv6 uh, flow label in the IPv6 header. So is that a yes or no answer? Yeah, um, if 
if I have a preference, I think I prefer to use it here in the SRH optional TRV because I see if you use it, I've, I've already mentioned, if you use it in the, um, in the IPv6 header, that will, and this information is encapsulated at the ingress node that will, that, I mean, the IPv6 flow label can only be used for this function, but not for the ECMP, like uh, ECMP uh, in other parts of the, the forwarding pass. Okay, so we have two people in the queue, Eric yes. and then Darren. So Eric, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yeah, I have, thank you. I have a multi-part question. Uh, so my scan of the document is that you want to ha allocate some new um, TLVs from within the, the segment reading header? Yeah. And the IANA registry for that looks like it's IETF review, which means, uh, you know, it doesn't, which means this doesn't have to be done in six man. Uh, so this could be done by spring or it could be to somewhere else. Uh, I'll, I, you know, I don't know. I'll leave it to you and the chairs in the group to decide if it belongs in six man, but I'll just observe that I, I think it doesn't have to be done here in order to get your um, IANA allocation, so. Oh, okay. I'm not aware of this, so I, I yeah, yeah I, I don't intentionally to put it in six men. I thought uh, it should be there, but if not, that we can also uh, move it to uh, Spring Working Group because we also have this uh, mechanism defined there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'll leave this to the, to the Working Group chairs. <laughs> Yeah, Darren. Make the same comment as as Eric on the on where this could live, but um, but since that's already made, I just wanted to make a comment on the on the flow label. If you do want to move this flow ID into the flow label, uh, load balancing nodes are supposed to take into account more than just the flow label uh, when they when they determine uh, how they're going to be performing ECMP or UCMP load balancing. So um, if you're concerned that, uh, that uh, you may not have as much uh, variability in that flow label, if it's equal to what you're specifying as a flow ID, that, that concern may not be all that great. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I agree with you. Yeah, okay. yeah the, the ECMP, UCMP, is, uh, it, it should be protected uh, from this, uh, it should be used, uh, it should be, uh, they should have this uh, capability to use it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I would add that if this is to the other point, if this is just wanting to define a TLV for SRH, then I think having that work in spring would be at least fine with me. I'm not sure there's anything particularly IPv6 thing that six men, I mean, it might be good for six men to follow it, but I think Spring could definitely own it. It's more relevant to the work that's being done there. Uh, Stuart? Uh, of course, all the work on pre-off is happening in DebtNet. I would have thought that this belonged over there where there was a large body of people interested in building reliable um, streams. Yeah, actually, we have this history that we first proposed this in that that, and after a few uh, meetings, uh, they they proposed that we should because this uh, this uh, the implementation no, um, the 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 it includes the the segment definition and also this how to encapsulate this metadata, and also include the the, the yeah the 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 uh, the SRV uh, the SR policy definition. So they they. The shift is worked from then to spring, and if if, if the chairs uh, agree that we can we can have this uh, I, uh, allocation in spring working group, I think um, we can just focus on the spring working group, and then after the after it's all done, and we come back to then that if if it is necessary. Yeah, actually, this work uh, proposed like two years ago to then that first. making any changes to the data plane but this is a function that DebtNet needs in my view. Yeah, uh, yeah yes, yes, 
uh, they're not needed, but they need the extension on SRB6. So we shift the work to XR, uh, to Spring. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay, good. Yes, yeah, so I think the conclusion is that probably six men is not the best place for, to own this work. And it could be Spring or Debt. Debt. Debt net or somewhere else. Thank it's you. It's okay, useful will... to use the working group that has the you need for it to define it and get review from the other working groups. You know, spring and and perhaps even six man in this case. So, but we we can take that offline. Yeah. Okay. So our next presentation, uh, Omni Adaption Layer, uh, Fred. The floor is is yours. Fred Templin, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Fred. You are. Go ahead. You hear me okay? We can yes. hear you okay. Okay. Uh, this presentation is on the Omni adaptation layer. Go to the next chart, please. So this is based on what's known as the Overlay Multilink Network Interface, the Omni Interface. And you can see the draft name there. Um, what it is is an overlay interface configured over multiple underlying interfaces. And if you look at the diagram on the left, that's uh, from RFC 5558 from back in 2010. You can see that thing called the VET interface is that side looking thing that is got some substance over un underlying interfaces. And then later in 2016, in RFC 7847, a better diagram was drawn. And you can see the Omni interface there is at a layer below IP, but above the underlying data link interfaces. That's the diagram that we're using from now on is the 7847 diagram. Next chart, please. So what about the Omni interface characteristics? It's an ordinary IP interface with a 9180 MTU. And what that means is that the IP layer expects the interface to deliver packets or fragments up to 9180 bytes. Internally, the interface performs IP encapsulation to convey original IP packets up to 9180 bytes over the diverse underlying interfaces. Well, we've got some things to think about though because the underlying network path MTUs are often much smaller than 9180. For example, the IPv6 minimum path MTU is 1280, and there's no in the network fragmentation allowed in the IPv6 paths. IPv4 minimum path MTU is only 576, and the reason for that is because the minimum IPv4 interface MTU is 68 bytes, but the network can fragment, and all destinations are required to assemble at least 576. So what the Omni interface needs to do is to adapt the Omni interface MTU to the underlying network path MTUs. And for that purpose, we have what's known as the Omni Adaptation Layer, or the OAL. Next chart, please. So what the OAL is, is an Omni Interface sublayer below the IP layer, but above the underlying interfaces. And it's based on RFC 2473 encapsulation, IPv6 encapsulation, in other words. Uh, when the IP layer delivers a packet to the Omni interface, remember it can be up to 9180 bytes, the OAL inserts an RFC 2473 encapsulation header and appends a two byte trailing Fletcher checksum to the o form the OAL packet. We count the trailer as part of the payload at this point when we put the, the payload length in the OAL header. Um, the OAL next then uses IPv6 fragmentation to break the OAL packet into fragments containing no more than the maximum payload size. So there you see the fragments, and each one of them has a payload in blue that is a portion of the original IP packet that is no larger than the MPS. And the final fragment has that little trailing checksum attached to it. Next chart, please. So then what happens next is that the OAL uh, source encapsulates each OAL fragment in underlying network headers, for example, UDP IP if we're sending over the internet, and then sends the packets over the underlying interface. So there you see the fragments from before 
but they have these little green U1, U2, U3 headers on them, which is the underlying network headers. And what's good about these things is that they will get across any network path because we've taken care to be sure that the maximum payload size is going to be small enough to fit into any path, uh, path MTUs, regardless of what interfaces there might be in the path. And when the, the fragments get to the OIL destination, it discards the underlying network headers, reassembles the OIL packet and verifies the checksum, and then discards the OIL header and trailer and delivers the original packet to the IP layer. Next chart, please. So how, how do we find out about this maximum payload size? Um, so some hops in IPv6 OIL destination paths could be over tunnels over IPv4, through IPv6 over IPv4 translators, et cetera. And the packets could also be asked to traverse multiple concatenated inner networks with diverse IP protocol versions. And I'll talk more about that later. The IPv4 minimum path MTU of 576 is therefore assumed unless there is better knowledge. So now let's look at some worst case analysis. Um, for the OAL encapsulation header, we have 40 bytes for the RFC 2473 header, plus 40 bytes for an OAL routing header, uh, a, a single routing header, plus eight bytes for the fragment header. So 88 bytes for OAL encapsulation. And then in each underlying network, the worst case we have would be a 40 byte IPv6 header or a 20 byte IPv4 header, plus 40 bytes for security encapsulations such as IPv6, SSL, TLS, et cetera, plus an eight byte UDP header. And therefore we know that the minimum maximum payload size is 576 minus 88 minus 88 equals 400 bytes. That means that in the worst case, we can expect that if we limit our payload size to 400 bytes, these fragments will get through any path anywhere in the network. So for an example, if we had a 1500 byte original IP packet, that would take up four OAL fragments, three fragments with 400 byte payloads, and the final fragment with 302 byte payload, which includes the two octet trailer. But fortunately, larger per path maximum payload size values can often be determined so that we don't have to have all of this overhead and all these fragments. Next chart, please. So the OAL source can set path maximum payload size values that are larger than the minimum maximum payload size for specific OAL destinations. So if the OAL source knows without probing that the path can transit a larger MPS without loss, it can set that larger value for that OAL destination. Otherwise, the OAL source can send probes to the OAL destination to discover larger path MPS values. And that probing would be in the standard of RC4821 or RC8899, um, which uh, is, is MTU probing. Um, the OIL encapsulation need, is not needed when the source and destination are on the same link and the original IP packet fits within the link MTU. So, so the game here is you want to send with as few encapsulations as possible, preferably with no encapsulations. And that's a case in which you can get away without even having to have the, the, the 247.3 header. Next chart, please. Okay, so by again, by using the minimum ma maximum payload size, we have a safe, safe assumption that works over all paths and non-final OAL fragments must contain at least this much worth of payload. So we wouldn't have any tiny fragments. Uh, the only OAL extension headers that are, can be included are one fragment header and one uh, ORH, but no other IPv6 extension headers. And that allows OAL destinations to drop any non-final fragments less than minimum pay, maximum payload size of payload, which defeats the tiny fragment attacks. And OIL destinations drop OIL frat packets and fragments with OIL extension headers, other than a single fragment header and a single uh, uh, omni-routing header. Next chart. So since we're inserting an RC2473 header, we need to have IPv6 source and destination addresses to put inside of it. And for that, we use RFC 4193 uh, unique local addresses with uh, uh, the FD um, colon, colon slash eight. 
uh, as the source and destination to enable forwarding at a layer below IP. So from the perspective of the inner IP layer, be it IPv6 or IPv4 or some other IP version, the OAO forwarding would be indistinguishable from layer two bridging. And that means that we can use it to traverse multiple independent inner networks that are concatenated by bridges. Next chart. So here's what it looks like in a single network tra traversal. We have an original source that sends an original IP packet that traverses some edge network until it gets to a node that has one of these Omni interfaces. You can see the diagram on the left there with the Omni interface. And that Omni interface then performs uh, OAL packetization and then breaks the OAL packet into encapsulated fragments that you see down by the blue cloud there. Those fragments are guaranteed to get through that blue cloud and get to the OAL destination, which reassembles and then uh, removes the encapsulation headers and forwards the, the original packet to the final destination. Next chart. So, so what happens if we have multiple networks that we want to traverse? Um, we have the original source sends to uh, the first blue network, and there's an intermediate node between the blue and the red networks that has an Omni interface, and it performs Um, I'm sorry, is my audio visible? I'm getting a signal that there's some errors. Yeah, same thing happened to me. It seems to be back now. Uh, we can hear you, Fred. OK, OK. So then the second intermediate node concatenates the red and the yellow networks together at a layer below IP. And then the packet finally pops out to the final destination where the Omni interface nearest the final destination, uh, removes the encapsulations, and forwards the original IP packet to the final destination. Next chart, please. So this Omni encapsulation lets us do some interesting things. We can create what's called a super packet. And Omni original, uh, original IP packets that are smaller than the Omni interface MTU and arrive in bursts can be concatenated together into a single packet. Um, Fred, you have back five minutes, so. OK, OK, I'll try to move faster then. Um, so this, it may be more efficient to pack multiple original packets into a single OAL super packet. As you can see here, we've got multiple IP packets in a single OAL header in the checksum trailer. Next chart, please. Uh, OAL packet size feedback. Although the interface accommodates packets up to 9180, it's not always good to continuously send such large packets. Classical path MTU discovery sends back a packet to big hard errors to inform the sources of packet loss due to size restrictions. But the Omni interface supports continuous forwarding of packets up to 9180 bytes while sending packets to big soft errors. And what this results in is lossless path MTU discovery, which is kind of like a holy grail thing that we've been searching for for, for really decades and a, a way to do this. Uh, it's a new capability for hosts to dynamically tune packet sizes for optimal performance without loss. Next chart. Uh, OAL is a new in, in sublayer, so it has to include its own integrity check. Uh, it uses Fletcher because it's dissimilar from the underlying inter interface CRC32 and the upper layer internet checksum. Um, Underlying networks can disable UDP checksums if, if possible, because we've got the OAL checksum. And the some underlying network hops might not include integrity checks at all. So in that way, the OAL checksum actually improves the integrity of the internet over the current state of affairs. And Bob, if I could very quickly jump to that, that uh, backup chart. So, Bridging of multiple network segments. The Omni link consists of segments joined by OAL and intermediate nodes acting as bridges, as I showed in that earlier diagram. Some examples of what these blue, red, and yellow networks would be. In civil aviation, we have these multiple providers, including Airink, CETA, Inmarsat, and others. Um, another example might be bridging network segments within an enterprise network. Uh, another example might be bridging multiple enterprise networks like uh, Boeing, Airbus, Lockheed, just to name a few names there. Um, 
But an even more relevant example to this group is that this can be used to bridge the IPv4 and IPv6 internets. So we can say that the IPv6 transition would be satisfied by putting an Omni interfaces out there, and then we'd be able to run IPv6 everywhere, even though the network is not always all transitioned to IPv4. We just bridge between the IPv4 and IPv6 internets. And that's my last chart. Okay, is there any okay. comments? Or If there are no comments, then I think Fred, uh, I think you have some echo on your side. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm not sending audio right now. Is it, is it, is it feeding back? At some, at least someone had echo. Uh, don't worry about it, because uh, you, you are on the okay. next presentation as well, right? Um, okay. And you can take more questions on this one at the end as well, right? Okay. Super, go ahead, Omni IPv6 ND okay. message sizing. IPv6 neighbor disturbing message sizing, and the, again, this relates to Omni. Next chart, please. Again, we see our Omni interface here. Next chart. So IP, IPv6 neighbor discovery messages, such as RS, RA, NS, NA, include uh, um, options and the IPv6 neighbor sub discovery message options in TLB format is defined in RFC 4861. This is an 8-bit type and an 8-bit length field um, in front of the, the, the value. Next chart, please. So since IPv6 neighbor discovery message option length field encodes the length of the option in eight octet units, that means that the maximum length IPv6 neighbor discovery option is 2040 octets. T55 times eight equals 2040 octets. Um, Omni sub options that go inside of an Omni option are also TLBs, but they're expressed in one octet units, excluding the type and the length fields. Omni sub options may include large objects like ASCII strings, uh, uh, fully qualified domain names, protocol messages, and others. And so the Omni sub options need to be made to include the maximum allowed for a single Omni option, a single IP6 neighbor discovery option. So for that reason, the draft now fixes the sub option type field to five bits and length field to 11 bits instead of the former eight plus eight. Next chart, please. So the Omni option is an IPv6 neighbor discovery option with one or more sub options. So you see the Omni option there on the left. It has essentially a blank slate that you write sub options into. And then the sub option format is on the right there where you have this five bit subtype, 11 bit sub length, and then the sub option data. Uh, sub option types include pad one, pad n, and several others that are in the document. Now with the 11 bit sub length field, that means that each sub option can include up to 2048 octets. Uh, but if that would cause the Omni option to exceed its total length, the information already processed in the Omni option is accepted and the final sub option is ignored. Next chart. So since a single IPv6 neighbor discovery message may include multiple Omni options, all are going to be processed in the order of appearance and the union of information is accepted. Large object fragmentation across multiple Omni options is not currently supported. It would be specified in the future if necessary, but at this point it doesn't look like it's needed. But IPv6 neighbor discovery messages as large as the Omni interface MTU are permitted. Uh, 9180 bytes for an IPv6 neighbor discovery message uh, with no IPv6 fragmentation per RFC 6980. Um, that means that we can craft a large neighbor solicitation message as an Omni adaptation layer path maximum pro payload size probe if we can get it to generate a small neighbor advertisement reply and return. Next chart. So the way it works is that the Omni adaptation layer can craft a large NS probe by including Omni options with large pad ends then send the probe over an underlying interface without any fragmentation. If the OAL destination gets it, it quickly skips over the pad ends and returns a small neighbor advertisement without padding, 
and that small neighbor advertisement is assured to traverse all paths in the reverse direction. This allows us to test the one-way path from the OIL source to the OIL destination across any concatenated underlying networks in the path. Um, individual probes are expendable, they don't interfere with data traffic, and single probe success may indicate the opportunity to increase the path maximum payload size. But we still need continuous probing to detect path MPS changes in case there's a change in the path. Next chart. And this is what it looks like. So the OAL source sends a large NS message on the left-hand side. Uh, it may or may not make it to the final destination. If it makes it, the final destination sends a small neighbor advertisement message in the reverse direction, and that's gonna be assured to traverse all paths back to the original source. So that's how we do the one-way probing to get our maximum payload size larger for, for the OAL fragmentation. Next chart. And I think that's the end for that. Yep. Any uh, questions or follow up for Fred? I, I've made some pretty uh, bold claims in the original presentation at first, uh, including the fact that we can consider the IPv4 and IPv6 transition to be good if we adopt Omni because we're already where we need to be. Um, I, I would think some, some of those things might warrant some further discussion. Any comments from the working group? Fred, I, I'm sorry to admit that I, I don't, we're having trouble seeing that there being any significant interest in this work here. Well, if there is no more people in the queue, I think we'll, um see each other again on uh, on Thursday with the more uh, regular working group session. Uh, so that's going to be 1600 to 1800 UTC. That's uh, morning, West Coast, US. Um, and in the meantime, follow up on the mailing list with, you know, if there's any interest in, in these drafts that um, you know, have a, have a chance of, of, you know, either finding other working groups uh, uh, to continue their work or, or be adopted here. But uh, we need to see some active interest in the working group to pick any of them up. Um, Alexandra, do you want to say something? Um, so, yeah, I'm, uh, this is related to the polls that have been run uh, in Miteco. I see there are two polls, but I don't know what are the questions. I see the results in the polls. but. Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, I forgot to put the draft in the uh, in the poll. The first poll was just a test, and the second one was for the uh, first draft we had today. I didn't run the polls for the for the other drafts, um, so we'll have to take that to the mailing list if there is interest to uh, to continue work or, or in this working group or in other places. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Um, unless there's some other topics, I think we are done for today. So we'll give you a little more time for your day um, and see you at the next session. <laughs>